This week on the Mind, Body and Soul podcast with John Morris. I am joined by a man who revolutionized the wrestling industry in the mid-90s. He's become one of the most controversial figures in the industry, and in this two-part special, he sets the record straight once and for all about so many situations and accusations that alleged had his involvement. My special guest on the Mind, Body and Soul podcast this week is a legendary Eric Bischoff. Welcome to the Mind, Body, and Soul podcast with John Morris. Inspiring, motivating, and educating you in finding balance in the craziness of day-to-day -day life. Learn from and listen to a man who has a wealth of life experience, from business to bodybuilding, artist to author, and has learned to deal with his own physical and mental wellness. But that's not all. Each week, John interviews and picks the minds of special guests from all around the world and from all walks of life. From actors to authors, wrestlers to warriors, business owners to life coaches, and so much more. Welcome to today's episode of the Mind, Body, and Soul podcast with John Morris. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls and children of all ages, welcome to another exciting episode of the Mind, Body and Soul podcast. I am your host as always, John Morris, and welcome to the show that inspires you, motivates you and educates you in your journey in finding balance in day-to-day -day life. My guest today is an author. He has been the vice president and president of a major sports entertainment company. He revolutionized his particular industry and niche and became one of the most controversial people and persons, rightly or wrongly, um, in history of his niche. He is the author of the, the book that I'm reading at the moment, Controversy Creates Cash. He's got his own podcast and is the star of it called H3 Weeks. And I am delighted to bring on and chat with the amazing Eric Bischoff. Eric, welcome to the show, my friend. How are you doing today? I'm doing very well, John, and thank you for the invite. I was, I've been looking forward to this. It's going to be a lot of fun for sure. Uh, and like I said, you know, off air, I'm hoping that we're going to be able to cover some stuff that the other folks haven't been able to cover. Eric, for the fans at home that maybe have never encountered you before, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, <laughs> I'm 65 years old, so there's a fair amount of ground to cover. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how comprehensive you you, you want to be but i Small you know I, I grew up in detroit i grew up in detroit michigan um and uh, in, in a very lower middle class uh neighborhood and uh lived there till i was about 13 uh -huh. and moved with my family to pittsburgh pennsylvania and then eventually to minneapolis while i was still in high school uh, i spent a couple of years in college a uh, complete waste of time <laughs> but I had a lot of fun. I, I, I did have a great time and made some good friends. Um, but I've always been more or less, not more or less, I've always been an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And while I've taken different, you know, formal employment uh, throughout my life, it's they have been brief moments <laughs> for the most part. And I've spent the majority of my life as an entrepreneur, primarily in the entertainment business, and uh, continue to... to uh, to do that today. Absolutely. And that, that's a fantastic answer. Now, there's a lot of people watching this show that, again, that have seen you on TV. And it was one of the, the I suppose, the most popular comment that came back from people that don't know you. And that's part of the purpose in doing this show today that, oh, Eric was born with a silver spoon in his mouth, but nothing could be <laughs> further from the truth. You know, like you say, you grew up in Detroit, that the, the former Motor City, as it were, now obviously very, very... Uh, much struggling but you know back in 1955 on May 27th and in doing my research I found that you know your dad um you know had some issues you, you didn't grow up in in you know all pretty and happy circumstances your dad had issues with his spinal cord uh which led obviously to massive headaches and he goes in for surgery and he ends up coming out with no headaches or anything but no use of his fingers and limited movement in his arms what was your understanding of all of this as a young child you know, I was actually too young to really okay. comprehend what it possibly could have meant. Now, I will tell you that 
the the years, decades really, um, following that surgery had a pretty profound impact on me because my father, you know, before he went in for brain surgery, he he was, you know, he grew up on a farm. He loved to hunt. He loved to fish. He was a very physical person. He loved to work with his hands. He loved carpentry. Uh, he was like, you know, most of the people in my neighborhood, really, who who grew up in a similar fashion and eventually moved to Detroit to take a job in, in, in industry, probably almost exclusively the automotive industry. Um, but, you know, I remember as a young boy, watching out the the window of our living room as my mother and my father got into the car and they were taking my father to have which is essentially it was brain surgery yeah. the, the spinal issue involved the connection really between the brain and the spine and that's where the issues were with him and you know i was too young to understand just how you know again this is probably about 1961 or yeah. 62 so i was only six or seven years yeah. old and clearly didn't understand how serious something like brain surgery was, especially in 1962. It would be a serious, yeah. you know, operation today, but back in 1962, before the advancement of medical technology and science and all the things that we know today, it was an even riskier uh, surgery. So, but I, I, you know, I sensed in my parents, their concern and their fear, they yeah. were young, you know, it's hard for me to, you know, think of my parents as being in their thirties and in my mom's case in her twenties. But that's how old they were. And they were, they were kids. You know, I look at 20 and 30 year olds today and 35 year olds as children, partly because my own children are that age. But, you know, it's hard for me to really comprehend yeah. the, the fear that they must have had. It was the decades that followed the, the frustration, the anxiety, the self-worth issues that my father went through, all the insecurities about being, you know, again, this is, you know, the 60s in the United States when, you know, the prevailing cultural landscape had, you know, the, the man of the house is the breadwinner and the, the, the wife or the mother in the house was taking care of the kids and taking care of the household. And, and wives working outside of the home was culturally yeah. kind of frowned upon. It was a sign that the, 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 the male in the household the, the, wasn't capable of providing yeah. enough for his family so his wife would have to go out and work. So it was, it was unlike today where that, you know, a husband and wife working together as a team is, yeah. is an aspirational type of thing in our culture, fortunately. Back in this early 60s, it wasn't the case. Yeah. And that created so much tension. Mm -hmm. Aside from the, just the stress, you know, if you can imagine a 30-year-old, a, a 28, 30-year-old guy who is a very physical guy, very physical, and all the things that he loved to do. And now, now he comes home from the hospital and he can't even dress himself yeah. or brush his own teeth or comb his own hair. And he's reliant upon his wife to take care of him in that respect. It was very demoralizing, mm -hmm. I think degrading for my father. And that had a pretty profound effect on his life for decades afterwards. And I certainly remember the manifestation of all that it, and it is, I mean, it's, it, and it is, it's, it's really interesting how, you know, we've covered this in other shows, how one event can literally change the entire course of your life. Um, you know, and, and the crazy thing is, you know, you, you were talking about working and certainly in the 60s, it was the whole, the whole thing. The woman stays at home, the man goes out, makes the money, and that was the way things are. Now it's obviously completely different. My wife and I, we work together. But the, the even more crazy thing I found with, with my research um, was between the ages of six and eight, you were out working. And, you know, was that, and, and that's just incredible to think about that. Uh, you know, was that more out of, you know, necessity or was that something that was exciting for you to, to be doing? Oh, no, it was, it, look, <clears throat> as challenging as life was, primarily for my mother and father, not so much for, for me or my brother or sister, um, because we didn't understand it all. We weren't at least initially affected by it. Now we were subsequently affected by the relationship between my mother and father and the stress that that created because of everything else. But as kids, we were, my parents did a good job of trying to keep us away from, mm -hmm. you know, the challenges. So for me, you know, as soon as I was old enough, it was a funny story. I think I may have told it in a book. I may not have, but I, I heard the story because I was too young to remember mm -hmm. But at some point when I was four or five years old or whatever, I ran away from home. 
I decided I was gonna I was gonna run away, run away from home and go to my cousin's house who lived probably about 12 or 15 miles away. Had no idea how I was gonna get there. <laughs> Had no idea how to find it, even if I knew how to get there. But I thought, well, I'm gonna need some money. So I decided to go around in, in my neighborhood at that time. Um, we called it pop in Michigan. It's also called soda. Okay. Uh, yep. But it's soft drink, like Coke and Pepsi and all that. And it came in bottles and there was caps on the bottles. And people would pop, you know, the, the pop off the, or the cap off the bottle and just throw it in the dirt, throw it on the street or whatever. So I decided I was going to collect all of those caps, put them in a bag, and I was going to sell them door to door. <laughs> it didn't occur to me that people didn't have any need for them. Yeah. But ironically enough, how many people are going to turn down a five-year-old kid that's coming up to the door and trying to sell them a bottle cap for a nickel? <laughs> and I ended up making me, you know, now that was probably the, that probably had a pretty big impression on me because from that point forward, as I got older mm -hmm. and, you know, I mowed lawns for a living during the summer, I shoveled snow in my neighborhood during the winter. You know, I delivered newspapers for the Detroit Free Press when I was 10 or 11 years old. I'd get up in the mornings, on the weekends especially, at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, in the wintertime, on my bike, go down, pick up my load of papers, go all the way back to my neighborhood and deliver them and, you know, collect once a week. And I was making $16, $18, 20 a week as a 10-year-old wow. kid delivering newspapers. And that, I mean, it's not that it was so much money, but it was my money. Yeah. And it was, I, I immediately connected effort, idea, and work to cash. And, and I think all that did was kind of fuel, <laughs> fuel that entrepreneurial instinct that I was probably born with, but nurtured really just by growing up in the neighborhood that I did and the way that I did. But that's always been something that's fascinated with your story uh, and from a business and mindset perspective. And it feels, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you have, you've had great fortune, first of all, but you've also had great instinct um, and discipline and mindset rather than, as you said, the formal education, because you were like, well, like, you know, I've started doing this education stuff, but like your, your lovely wife, uh, who said the exact same thing, she was like, I just was so eager to get out and, and make things happen. Was that the kind of mindset that you had moving forward into your college years and obviously further study? Well, um, of the characteristics that you mentioned there a moment ago, discipline was never one of them. <laughs> um, I, I was very driven mm -hmm. and um, that was a kind of, that was a conflict for me because uh, patience has never been something that I've been able to cultivate in my personality. And it's, it's a challenge for me even yeah. today. So is, so is discipline. Um, I think because and this is probably true with people who are entrepreneurs or creative people who are entrepreneurs. And I kind of throw myself into that category. Um, while the creative and entrepreneurial side of your brain is hyperactive, oh. the other side of your brain that requires discipline and focus and, and uh, procedure <laughs> is kind of inactive. Yes. So I've always had this right brain, left brain war going mm -hmm. on inside of my skull. Um, every once in a while, I have to focus and be disciplined. And, and, and I'm grateful when I do, but it's not a natural thing for yeah. me. So um, going to school for me was obligatory. I, I, I went, you know, I love to wrestle. I, I, I wrestled in high school. And out, out after high school, I wrestled um, on the AAU freestyle and Greco-Roman wrestling teams. And the only reason I went to school was to get girls and to wrestle. <laughs> and sometimes I did both. Yeah. But um, it was at the same time. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I, I had no aspirations to go to college all the way through my senior year in high school. Um, I, I had planned, actually I had, um, planned on joining the military. Oh, wow. And, uh, went so, went so far, uh, my freshman year in college to join the, uh, the ROTC, actually the NROTC, the Marine Corps version of ROTC to supplement my, my college expenses mm -hmm. got sworn in and everything. But of course, one of the, one of the obligations was that in order to go into the military as an officer, I had to graduate from college and, 
I, I, I couldn't take it. I couldn't yeah. take four years of what I considered to be useless information <laughs> when I could be out making more money than the professors who were teaching me in college. The, and I did exactly that. Well, I was just going to say that in, because you left college and obviously the first business that you started, if I've got this right, in the 70s was making a lot of money. Yeah, well, even before that, um, slightly before that, you know, I was working in a restaurant in downtown Minneapolis, right real near the University of Minnesota where I was attending college. I started out as a dishwasher and then I became a cook and, and I loved it. You mm -hmm. know, I, it, it was a 24 hour restaurant. I would work the night shift from 11 at night to seven in the morning. I, I don't know why, but I just loved it. And eventually became a manager. You know, while I was going to, to college, I was a full-time restaurant manager in a pretty big restaurant. And it was at that time I went, you know, this, this college thing is just not for me. Yeah. And shortly thereafter, I started a, a construction company, landscape and construction company, which by the time I was 22 years old, I was, I was making six figures yeah. in 1975. That was a lot of money. Still is a lot of money, but it was even more back then. Absolutely. And it's, it's incredible. And, you know, one of the things that has been apparent over your career is, you know, you, you've made a lot of money, you've known the high times, you've also known the low, low times as well. And you've got a really good balance in terms of the experience that you've gone through. Um, you know, and, and like you say, I mean, the 70s, you were making five figures. And that's, you know, I, I don't even know what that would equate to today without looking it up. But it was, you know, it, it's a good amount for sure. Little seeds are often sown in our journey and in our life. And you mentioned a love of wrestling and obviously a love of martial arts as well, which is something that we, we both enjoy um, you know, what was the, I suppose, the draw for you with wrestling and with martial arts? Well, I think with wrestling, um, part of it was to be honest with myself is I sucked at football. <laughs> I hated baseball. Um, I, I, I just didn't like playing baseball. It was boring for me. I wasn't any good at basketball. The only two things I could do was run fast and wrestle. And, and in ninth grade, I joined the cross country team because I've always, in, I just love to run. I'm not a, necessarily a gifted or I wasn't, I'm certainly not a gifted runner now, but as a young kid, um, I, I wasn't necessarily gifted as, as a runner or as a wrestler, but I loved it. And, and up until a recent knee injury, a little over a year or two ago, mm -hmm. um, I I run for I run for my head yeah. as much as for my body. It makes me feel good. Um, it's hard to explain. I don't know if it's the endorphin rush or the fresh air or the combination of all of the above, and and the stress. I I, I love the physical stress. I love to push my body. Yeah, or I did. <laughs> I avoid it now, but. Um, and, and wrestling was the same thing. It, it was an individual sport. I, I, I like I said, I, I wasn't big enough or strong enough or fast enough or talented enough to play football. And same was true with basketball. So wrestling was like, okay, well, I know I can do that. You know, growing up in Detroit, I probably ended up in two or three street fights a day, you know, from the time I was seven or eight years old to the time I was 15 years old. So you know, that kind of physical contact was second nature to me. And it, it just, it felt good. I enjoyed doing it. And, and, it, and it's true. And I think trying to explain any to anybody, you know, why we enjoy amateur wrestling, why we enjoy martial arts, or even why we enjoy bodybuilding or running or whatever it might be, is you know, it, it, sometimes it's really difficult. But like you say, it's because it felt good. It was something that gave you the adrenaline rush and that you thoroughly loved. Something else that you absolutely love, just before we move on from, I suppose, uh, your, your childhood or your, your younger years, um, that you have a love of now is obviously the love of nature. And I'm assuming, if I've got this correct, that that came from your move from Detroit to, was it Pittsburgh that you moved to next, when you were surrounded by the mountains and forest and, and everything that was there. What impact did that make on you? Actually, I think it was my father, you know, um, before um, his surgery, he would take me um, upland bird hunting because that was a big part of his life. His cool. brothers, which would be my uncles, um, their kids, which would be my cousins, you know, getting together in the fall and going pheasant hunting was a 
family ritual. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was an important, it was just, just as important as Christmas or, yeah. or any other holiday. Do you, your son or daughter struggle with direction, clarity and purpose? Maybe you struggle with anxiety. Maybe you struggle with self-esteem or confidence issues. Maybe you've got great ideas, but you've no idea how to get from where you are to where you want to be. Don't worry, you're not alone. People around the world struggle with these issues. Hi there, I'm John Morris. I'm the coach of the creative mind and I'm also a psychologist in training. For the last two decades, I've worked with people from all walks of life and all over the world, all with a wide variety of issues. I've worked with people from youth groups to adult education to people dealing with day-to-day -day living issues. And each one of them has an amazing story to tell and we've helped them get clear as to where they are and clear as to where they want to be. And I want to help you too. Unlike a lot of life coaches and therapists that like to drag things on and leave you dangling on the carrot, I want to make sure that each and every single time that we meet and have a life coaching session together, that you never ever leave saying, man, that was a waste of time, or I didn't get the value that I desired. I am committed to making sure that each and every single time we meet, you are one step closer by the time we finish to a goal that you have in mind. So why should you work with me? Well, let me tell you, as I said, I'm committed to making sure that I provide value, that I provide something that's step by step and easy to follow. I'm also a fantastic listener. I've been blessed with the gift of listening and I love to listen to people, their stories, their, their dreams, their desires, because there's nothing more energetic and passionate to me than when a client gets their first desire or they get that goal or they hit that big target or whatever it might be. And also, as the trifecta, I'm committed to you to helping you take action. So whether or not it be deciding on the university you want to go to, deciding on the course that you want to be at, helping you get excited and passionate about your work environment, whatever it might be, I am committed to helping that happen. I'm also committed if you need to shed some pounds, if you need to gain some muscle mass, if you need to, I don't know, develop your self-esteem, I'm committed to helping you take action and following a step-by-step plan of action that we can put together. But now folks, I want to tell you about the early bird special offer that we are launching right now. It is for 10 people and 10 people alone. That's right, if you are interested in having life coaching sessions with me one-on-one, -on -one, 10 people have the opportunity to do that. And we're looking to help these people change their lives completely. We take ages 14 and upwards. So if you're interested in learning how to get from where you are to where you want to be, to really develop that passion to live a life that you enjoy as opposed to a life that you wake up and think, ah, oh. you know, how to develop and change your mindset from maybe a negative one to a positive one, understanding what fuels your mindset and understanding what creates the kind of life that you want to live, then get in touch with me today. I would love to hear from you. As I say, this is open only for 10 people and once it's done, it's done. So click that box below, get in touch. Let's have a conversation backwards and forwards and see if we're a fit for each other. And I look forward to working with you. Have an amazing day folks take care god bless and i will see you soon and you look for, i as a kid you know i look forward to it and, and my dad would take he just took, take me along i mean i was too small obviously to hunt but i got to be a part of it yeah and i got to feel a part of it and uh, to this day you know pheasant hunting is in fact i'll be going on thursday morning uh two days from now uh, pheasant hunting is still something that kind of brings me back to that time in my life when when I was a kid growing up and it's, it stayed with me. Now, when I moved to Pittsburgh, because Detroit, you know, it was, you didn't get a lot of outdoors or forests yeah. or hills or anything. Detroit is a very flat industrial yeah. environment. You know, there's, there's not much to see there. You know, if you go into Northern Michigan, three, 400 miles away, it's much different, but Detroit proper where I lived was fairly bleak in uh -huh. terms of its landscape. When I moved, when my family moved to Pittsburgh, we moved into a suburb of Pittsburgh that was geographically completely different. It was lots of trees and yeah. hills and, and we even had pheasants, you know, in our backyard, you know, and it was like, <laughs> whoa, this is amazing. Yeah. And I, I think more importantly, when I, as a young boy, when I moved to Pittsburgh, there was a gentleman by the name of uh, Bob racy or his real his real full name was racy Oppie, but okay. he went by bob racy and he you know bob was only about i was 15 he might have been 24 25 so he was like nine or ten years older than me so he he knew that i loved to hunt he knew that i loved to do things outdoors my father by that point had 
more or less given up on all of that. Okay. Um, emotionally. And I mean, physically he could still walk and everything, but he couldn't hunt. And he just, he, I think he was so depressed about it all. He just turned his back on it all. And my neighbor, Bob, kind of more like a big brother to me, I guess, mentor, big brother, kind of filled that void um, that was there because of my father's situation. And he took me, you know, he took me hunting, he took me deer hunting. And I know, you know, people listening to this are probably thinking, oh, it's horrible. They hunted deer, they hunt pheasant. There's, people are kind of anti-hunting. But again, this was in the 60s and the yeah. 70s, folks. So lighten the hell up. Um, <laughs> but, but I got to experience all of that. Their life. It is. It is. And it's hard to explain to people that don't enjoy mm -hmm. that type of thing. And I don't feel the need to. But to me, it was always a connection, yeah. you know, with what's real. And even to this day, I, I hunt, not because I have to, um, and I don't necessarily enjoy taking an animal necessarily, but my wife and I eat wild game primarily. Yeah. We eat wild game. We don't like to eat meat that is processed and butchered and harvested and, when, and is full of antibiotics and hormones and you have no idea where it's come yeah. from or how it was raised or what it was fed. So even to this day, you know, I hunt still, but I hunt for different reasons today. Yeah. Part of it is because it's my family's heritage, but part of it is from a health and nutritional point yeah, of view, yeah. I feel better eating, you know, wild game that I've harvested mm -hmm. and processed myself versus buying something at a local Walmart. And, and absolutely, because, you know, I mean, I remember when Shawn Michaels, uh, you know, who also loves to hunt as well, you know, he left WWE and then he was just like, okay, what have I got next? And initially, when they talk about the, the hunting show that he did, I was like, okay, this is something completely different. But then when you understand, you know, exactly what you said there, you know where your food is coming from, you know what's in it, you know everything about it, um, and it's as fresh as fresh can be, it makes a big difference between, obviously, the stuff that you can buy that's probably got a ton of additives in and everything else. Um, so it definitely makes a, a big, big difference. But, um, but yeah, that, that's a whole other topic for a whole other day. But I wanted to ask you as well, because I know Laurie uh, covered this on uh, on the show that we did. And if you haven't seen that, folks, go out and check out the show that we did with Eric's wife, Laurie Bischoff. Um, and she was talking about the time that you and Laurie met. Uh, obviously, very, very quick. You know, she was in the uh, modeling agency. You came in. Take it from there, Eric. Well, it was a bit of a blur, but yeah, one <laughs> of the, you know, any number of vocations I've pursued in my life. There was a point in time when I was a, a, a commercial model and an actor and Lloyd was involved in a new agency and they were looking for new talent and I was a new talent looking for a good agency and I, I, I came in uh, for a, a, a more or less a casting call to Lori's agency and I looked over across the room and I saw Lori, who was only about 22 years old at the time or less. And I went, hmm, that's pretty interesting. <laughs> and the rest is history. Absolutely. And, and the crazy thing is, you know, the, in your book as well, Controversy Creates Cash, um, which we do encourage you to check it out because it will go further into depth than obviously we can do in this show. But, you know, you, you write about it, that it was that she, um, her business had a, a strict no dating talent, you know, policy. And I think your exact response was, ah, ah that ain't going to happen. You know, you, you knew exactly, uh, you know, what you guys wanted. And then the crazy thing is not too long after, if I've got this right, you guys become parents. Talk to us about the mental shift that takes place when you become parents. Well, yeah, it was about a, it was a couple of years after we okay. first met. Uh, maybe a year and a half for two years. Two, well, I think it was about two years. Um, well, it, you know, certainly it was unexpected. You know, <laughs> Lori and I had both, you know, casually talked about what our future might be. Uh, I, th I think we were both thinking along the same lines in terms of one day getting married and you know, but kids were not a part of any of that conversation because we were still so young and, yeah. and both of us had a lot of things that we wanted to pursue and do. And, you know, as 20 year olds can sometimes be, tend to be a little self-centered and, and, and selfish. <laughs> and 
we were, you know, we were thinking about all the things that we could do as, as a couple, whether we were married or not, and things we wanted to acquire and places that we wanted to travel, all types of, you know, great thoughts and, and ideas, none of which had anything to do with kids. And when Lori found out she was pregnant, you know, it was, a, it, and it was right in the middle of a pretty big transition yeah. because we had both moved to Chicago from Minneapolis to pursue modeling mm -hmm. and acting. And uh, it was while we were in Chicago that she became pregnant. And I, right about that same time, before we knew she was pregnant, I had gone back to Minnesota because I had been offered a job as a sales manager for a heavy equipment manufacturer. And, you know, I decided, you know, I tried this modeling thing out. It really isn't working out as well as I wanted it to be. And, and it, you know, we were doing okay, actually. We were doing pretty good. But even at 27 years old or whatever I was, 28, I went, wow, this is not something I'm going to do when I'm 40. Yeah. You know, um, so I, I had started putting out feelers and ended up getting a job offer in Minnesota. And it was, Lori had we had both made the decision that we're going to move back to Minnesota. I had gone back a little bit early to get things set up, mm -hmm. flew back to Chicago, went out one night to celebrate with some friends. <laughs> That's when Lori became pregnant. And it was a, shortly about a, you know, a couple of weeks thereafter why we had just gotten back to Minneapolis. In fact, we were living in my parents, my parents had a, it was in the summertime. My parents had a camper outdoors and we were literally, cause we didn't have a place to stay. We were living in a camper uh, it was great, by the way, we had a great time. But um, it was then that Lori found out she was pregnant. And we weren't married, had no plans on getting married anytime in the near future, even though we had kind of very generally discussed it. Yeah. But it was very noncommittal. You know what I mean? It was like, yeah, yeah maybe, you know, so that would be a good in. idea somewhere down the road, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. But once Lori found out she was pregnant, um, you know, it's kind of funny because Lori's always been fairly independent minded and so am I. And when she found out, you know, I went outside, uh, it was a Sunday, Sunday morning. I went and got the pregnancy test for her and brought it to her. And I went outdoors and was occupying myself with something. I don't know what I was doing. About 45 minutes later, Lori came out and said, it's positive. <laughs> And I knew in that moment what I wanted to do, but I didn't want to influence Lori. Yeah. I, because I, I have a strong personality. I'm aware of that. And sometimes I can run over the top of people without really intending to do so. I have a pretty strong force of will. And sometimes that's great. And sometimes it's not. Yeah. And I recognize that this was one of those times where it was not. Yeah. So I, I said, well, let's, uh, let's go out and get some breakfast and let's talk about this. Well, little did I know, Lori was of the same mindset. We both had made up our minds that we wanted to have our son Garrett. We didn't know he was a, we didn't know he was a son yeah. then, but we both knew that we wanted to have the baby, but neither one of us really wanted to kind of feel like we were forcing the other to go yeah. along with that decision. So although we were both of like mind, we were both very tentative about how we were going to engage the conversation. And we got to the restaurant and we sat down and ordered breakfast. And, you know, I said, well, what, what, what do you want to do? And she says, I want to have this baby. And I was so happy because that's exactly <laughs> what I wanted to do. And I didn't have to talk her into it or feel like I was. So it was a pretty easy decision. And, and from that point forward, everything else just fell into place. You know, we knew we were going to get married. We didn't want to get married while Lori was pregnant. So we waited until August, I think. Um, and, and, you know, Lori, you know, finally had the baby and I was able to walk down the aisle holding my son. Uh, it was all very special. It was all very cool. You know, we, we loved it. And everything, like I said, everything fell into place. It's, it is a really, really wonderful thing, uh, you know, and, and that part of your story. And obviously the story continues because if I've got this correct, you know, yourself and Laurie are really enjoying being parents um, and a friend of yours. Now, was it was he a martial arts friend in Sonny Ono that uh, talks to you about a new idea for a business? And this was the one that started to lead things perhaps into more of the entertainment and the, what was it, the... Um, 
help me phrase this, the game industry, if I've got that correct. Yeah, well, you know, we, we skipped over a little bit. Okay. Um, you know, before I met Lori in the late 70s, mid 70s, I'd always been interested in martial arts and had dabbled in it as a young kid, but never really had the money yeah. or the ability to, you know, get to classes on a consistent basis because I didn't have a driver's license. <laughs> Thing, you know, I had to take a bus to go to martial arts training, which was, you know, an hour and 40 minute bus ride by the time I finally got there. So it was very intermittent. And then once I, I left college and while I had my con construction company, I started really getting serious about martial arts and got so serious about it. I sold my construction company to my partner, cashed out and literally trained full time for about three years, four years, and quite proficient martial arts. I was very competitive and, and fought in a lot of tournaments. This was, of course, before the UFC. Oh, yep. Professional karate was known as the PKA or the Professional Karate Association. I actually fought on ESPN a couple times. Wow. Had one, two, two pro fights before I finally, you know, hung it up. Mm -hmm. But during that period of time, I had met Sonny Ono. And Sonny was a very, very proficient martial artist. He was one of the top rated bantamweights in the world professionally at the time. And he and I would travel around the country and we'd fight in these different tournaments together. And of course at night on the weekends when the tournament was over, we were busy chasing women and getting into all kinds of debauchery and trouble. And one night we were sitting around and, and I asked Sonny, you know, I said, tell me what you, cause Sonny grew up in, Sonny's a little older than I am, maybe a couple months older. And he grew up in Tokyo. And one night where we were consuming copious amounts of adult beverages, <laughs> I, I asked Sonny, I said, you know, what was your life like as a kid growing up in, in Tokyo? And he told me a story about, he was a kid, he and his friends, cause he grew up in a similar economic environment that I did very lower middle class and they would go around and they would find milk bottle caps because evidently in Tokyo and Japan at the time in the 60s you, you would have milk delivered to your house and it had a twist off cap on it and people would throw the caps away or whatever the kids would collect these little caps and they would play like these ninja stars they would play tag so but they were like throwing ninja stars and I used to do the same thing in Detroit, only my friends and I would throw rocks at each other. And if you got hit by the rock, you were out. Well, in Sonny's case, if you got hit by a milk bottle cap, you were out. That's what we did for fun. That's all we had. And by the end of the night, we had come up with this idea for a game called Ninja Star Wars, where you'd wear a felt vest with a little ninja character silk screen on the front. You'd have a little karate kid headband that had a real uh, pliable plastic eye protector in it. And you get three red stars and three black stars. And the stars were about this big and they were weighted down a little bit. So you could throw them across the room and they'd hit you and they'd stick. And, you know, the first person to get three stars on somebody won the game. I thought, well, that's a great idea. So we set about, manu we found a manufacturer in South Korea and he manufactured like 5,000 of these games or 3,000, whatever the number was. There was a lot of them. And we had them all shipped to the United States and we went, Okay, now how do we sell? Them? <laughs> like we never thought about that part, right? So we tried different things, you know, and we had a limited success. But it it, it was wasn't until um, about nineteen. This was all going down about 1985, 1986. 1987, I called Vern Gagne, who was he he had a wrestling organization yep. called the AWA, and he was producing a show on ESPN. And I had met Vern Gagne. Vern Gagne was a big supporter of amateur wrestling in Minnesota. And that's how I first met him. I'd actually gone on his show a couple of times or one time in particular promoting an amateur wrestling event that I was a part of. So I, I thought, you know what, if I just pick up the phone and I play the, you know, the amateur wrestling card, you know, amateur wrestler from Minnetonka, Minnesota, that's where I went to high school and Vern lived in the next suburb over. So he was very well aware of it. I said, you know, maybe if I just call him up and say, hey, this is Eric Bischoff. You know, I used to wrestle at Minnetonka High School. And, you know, you and I met in the regional tournaments. And, blah, 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 and I got this idea for a game. It worked, you know, and he invited yeah. me in and I demonstrated the game for everybody and they loved it. And we ended up doing what's called a, an infomercial. We see them yeah. all the time now. Advertisements and they, it's a direct response type of man. Yeah. 
and I cut a deal with Vern. I said, I'll produce the commercial. I had no idea how to do that, by the way. I'd never done one before, but I said, I'll do it. I'll produce the commercial. And I already have the games. If you put the commercial on the air and we sell a game, we'll split the profit 50, 50. And Vern decided that would work and wanted to give it a try. And we gave it a try and, you know, we sold a fair amount of games, but the end result was that Vern Gagne hired me to become um, uh, a salesman yeah. for the AWA wrestling organization. And that's really how I broke into the wrestling business. And, and it's really incredible. And two things I love, because again, you know, the connection that we share is, and you know, martial arts for me was something I absolutely loved, my trophy that's there. It brings back so many fond memories. And I was looking at for, for the, the purpose of doing this show as well. Um, but obviously, I, I was just chuckling in my brain there when, when you were saying about demonstrating this in front of Vern Gagne. Um, for anyone that hasn't seen Vern, go and, go and Google Vern Gagne's name, um, because I can just imagine his face as you're throwing these stars backwards and forwards, um, just, just thinking about it. So yeah, so, so you're now obviously in AWA. What was Laurie's reaction at that point when you say, honey, you know, we're in All-American Wrestling. This is, this is you know, what we're doing. Um, what was her kind of reaction at that point? Oh, she was very excited and supportive. Okay. She was excited because I was excited. You know, and that's the one thing about Lori, and and hopefully I she would say the same about me, um, is we've both been so supportive of each other, no matter no matter what the situation. And believe me, there has been situations <laughs> where I've been excited about doing something that made no sense whatsoever <laughs> from a financial point of view, from a timing point of view. Uh, I mean, I've, I've made some pretty, you know, wacky decisions in my life. I hear life. you on that. I've and been exactly always the same. <laughs> she, and she supported them no matter how yeah. good the ideas were, how bad they were. It didn't matter. She was fully supportive. And I think I've been the same for her. And that just kind of nurtured that entrepreneurial yeah. instinct because I never felt like, oh, I now I'm married and I've got two kids. So I've got to get a job and settle down and be a responsible yeah. adult. You know, I've, I've, I've always known I need to be a responsible, a, a responsible adult, but how I was responsible yeah. was completely with up to me. Yeah. That was my choice. And she was very supportive of it. Was your dad still around at this time um, when you're going to work for AWA? Um, yes. Okay. My dad, hold on. This is Lori right here. She doesn't know I'm on a Zoom call. <laughs> Hold on. I'm going to tell her I'm talking to you. Laurie, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to Mr. Morris in the UK. John, she says hello. Hello, Laurie. Hoping you're doing well. <laughs> okay, bye. <laughs> Sorry, I'll turn off my phone. That was That's rude. okay. <laughs> Shit happens. <laughs> it's a nice segment for the show. Uh, what was your dad's reaction, obviously, now that you, you, you've grown up similar to me, you know, watching wrestling and enjoying it, and now all of a sudden you're in at that time, a pretty major organization. Well, you know, I think my dad was proud of me because it was a fairly high, I mean, the AWA was not anything like the WWE no, is today or WCW yeah. was or anything like that. It, it was a smaller regional promotion, yeah. but it still it was a very popular one in Minnesota and had television you know every weekend in minneapolis so i think my dad was proud of me but because he didn't really understand it yeah he was fearful of it you know he grew up my dad grew up you know my dad was a young boy during the depression mm -hmm. you know he grew up on a farm he grew up with nothing yeah and he uh, you know i think people of that generation particularly men um feel like man you know job security is yeah. first and foremost it Absolutely. may not be the best job but you've got one and my dad was like that very much. And I think for my dad, seeing me as an entrepreneur, in his mind, I was bouncing from this and trying that, and fighting full contact karate. And now he's a sales manager over here. It's like, geez, he's probably, would you please just settle down just for a month? You know, give it a try. You might like it. But I think once I got into the AWA, he was pretty excited for me, even though he didn't really understand it from a job perspective. Yeah. He didn't know what I did. And it was hard for me to explain it to him uh, because he didn't really understand television, the business of television. But uh, I think he was pretty, pretty proud. I know my mom was, yeah. you know, my mom was very, very supportive, but my dad was tentative 
and his support. We, we share a lot of that because I've got that with my folks. And when you see, you know, I'm interviewing so-and-so, my mom's usually the one that's like, oh my goodness, that's so, so exciting. And my dad's just like, okay, I don't really get this, but you know, you, you've been doing this for 18 years now. And obviously now with the mind, body and soul movement and things, you know, I, I just kind of leave you to it and away you go. Not to skip over AWA completely, but, you know, obviously at this time it was going through financial difficulties and, you know, in your book, you talk about it in a lot more depth than obviously we've got time for tonight. Um, but what was it, maybe a couple of years after you leave the AWA and join WCW, is there anything specifically that you want to touch on before we move on? Well, you know, I think the thing that I value, you know, when I look back at my career, all the good things, all the bad things, all yeah. the things in between, you know, there's certain things that I define as life changing okay. decisions and yeah. moments that w without which, you know, my life would not be what it is today. Absolutely. And one of the things, you know, when I took the job working for Burn Gun, and it didn't take long for me to figure out that, you know, they were going bankrupt yeah. at a pretty rapid pace before I was even hired. And it didn't matter to me at first because I was, I loved the job. I was so exciting. I was working in television. There right. was all these things to learn because I knew experience. nothing about the television yeah. business. I, all I knew is that if I plugged one in and I turned it on, fun stuff came on TV. That's what <laughs> I knew about the television world. So to have an opportunity to learn so many aspects of the television business at a ground level, yeah. you know, I learned... I learned what television syndication meant and how it worked. I learned about advertising and sponsorships and how they worked. That was primarily my job when I was first hired in, in AWA. I had to learn that on the job, but I learned it. I eventually got into production and learned how to run a camera. I learned how to build sets. I learned how to edit. I, 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 I learned so much that even though the AWA from a financial point of view was a bad situation yeah. for me and everybody else, the value, the absolute value that I got from that experience mm -hmm. is worth probably more money than anybody could have possibly paid me at that time. Because it was that experience working for AWA that allowed me to achieve what I achieved in WCW. Absolutely. Now, now just before, we, well, in fact, yeah, we're at, we're at the point of WCW. This question I don't think has been asked in this way. And there's a very specific reason why I'm going to ask it like this. From your own lips, tell the people exactly what your role was in WCW. The reason that I asked it just before you do is because from podcasts, from interviews, from reading your book, from, from all of these different things, the people that seem to be blaming you for so many things left, right, and center. My opinion, and I know I'm probably get, you know, going to get you know, heat or, or whatever you want to call it, um, you could not have been responsible for some of the things that they're blaming you for. So that's why I asked the question. Go ahead, Eric. Well, I mean, it's hard to say because, you know, my role in WCW, for example, when I was first hired, yeah. I was a third string announcer meaning uh, as an on-camera talent, mm -hmm. I would do the international syndicated shows. I would do certain interviews. I, you know, Jim Ross was the number one announcer. Tony Schiavone was number two and I was number three. And I did all of the work that Tony or Jim didn't have time to do right. or didn't want to do. <laughs> that was my role. And that was my role when I got hired. It was my role all the way up until about 1993. Yeah when I was hired as, a, as the executive, well, I was promoted to mm -hmm. the executive producer. Now, as an executive producer, you know, that title means a lot of different things, depending on the different, what, what production you're on. It can mean absolutely nothing, and it's a vanity credit. More often than not, that's the case today. Um, it can mean that you oversee every aspect of a show, which it rarely means in, in today's environment. But in WCW specifically at that time, I had control over the technical yeah. aspects of the television production. I could choose the graphics. I could decide how to light the production. I could change the format. You know, I could, any number of things that had everything to do with how the show looked 
except for the talent <laughs> and the creative associated with yeah. it. That I had nothing to do with up until about 1995. Okay. By 1995, I was, I don't know if I was the senior vice president or executive, president. my titles changed quite a bit throughout the years. But by 1995, I had almost total control over the creative and the talent, as well as the production of the right. show, in addition to overseeing the business units within Turner Broadcasting. Okay. So my relationship with WCW and my responsibilities evolved over a course of time. Yeah. Now, just, just to bring the, the folks up to speed, we're talking about WCW, which is World Championship Wrestling. Uh, and, and again, Eric, if I've got my, my dates and my facts wrong at any point, do stop me. Um, but from what I can sort of ascertain from uh, between 88 and 89, Ted Turner, who was a lifelong wrestling fan, world renowned entrepreneur and the owner of Turd Broadcasting Network, he buys WCW. Now, WCW is really struggling. You know, it's uh, as, as Eric would say, context is key. Uh, and context is king. And when you buy something that's already broken and already struggling and already falling apart and you try to continue moving forward and trying to make it work, it, it's not going to bode well, basically. And sometimes, in my opinion, from a business perspective, the wise thing is to start from scratch and to see where you can raise, thing, uh, raise things up from. 1993, you get an amazing break. Um, talk to us about that and, and what was really happening? What was going through your head when you're being presented with, you know, th this, this move within WCW? Well, when I was hired as executive producer, that was the first big break. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I saw nothing but an opportunity to succeed. I, I had no fear of failure and Part of that was because WCW was already such a damaged property that it had nowhere to go up. But I think also I because you, I was just going to say you'd actually, what, in 91, but at a point where you guys were really struggling for money. We, obviously, sorry, I skipped over that, but where, you know, you guys were financially really in difficulty. So you'd been at the lowest of the low and now it's a case of, okay, well, I've been there. Now, like you say, the only way I can go is, is up. Sorry, please continue. Yeah, no, and, and that's true. Before I was hired by Turner Broadcasting, uh, AWA had already gone bankrupt. I was still working for them, even though they couldn't afford to pay me. But, you know, I was six or eight months behind in my mortgage payments. Wow. I was so far behind in my car payments that they were repossessing my cars out of my driveway. Uh, I'll never forget the morning the IRS showed up at my front door you know, looking for 10 or $15,000, wow. which at that time, they might as well have been looking for $300,000. Um, I was having a hard time keeping heat in my house. Yeah. I lived in Minnesota. Lori and I lived in Minnesota. Our kids were very young and I couldn't afford to pay the heating bills. So um, that was a challenge. So yeah, getting the job at WCW, you know, completely changed yeah. my financial outlook. Although I wasn't making a lot of money at the time, but to me, it felt like a lot of money when you're making nothing, yeah. you know, anything can be a lot. And, but by 1993 now, you know, financially we had gotten fairly stable and overcome a lot of those challenges that, that you know, were created or we created for ourselves by the choices we made, which don't regret, by the way, never regret them. But by 1993, now I've got an opportunity to be a key executive within WCW. And I just looked at it as a massive opportunity. Mm -hmm. I, I had no fear of failure. I, I had no inhibitions whatsoever. Fortunately, going back to what I said earlier, I had learned about so many aspects, yes. the different aspects of the business of the wrestling business, working for Vern Gagne, that by the time I got a management opportunity in WCW, I'm going to try to be humble when I say this, but it's going to be hard. I probably knew more yeah. about all the facets of the wrestling business than anybody in Turner Broadcasting. I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't an expert on any of them, but I was much more knowledgeable yeah. than any on most of those elements of the business of the wrestling business because of the experience that I had learning from the ground up when I, when I got an opportunity to work for Vern Gagne in AWA. So I had absolutely no fear. I was, I was very aggressive in what I wanted to do and how I wanted to do it. And um, I had a blast.
And, and it's fantastic. And, and, you know, it's such an interesting uh, period in time now because to, to set the stage for folks, as, as Eric's journey is going to continue, uh, just to bring you guys up to speed, WWE was the WWF at the time, World Wrestling Federation, and their rival in somewhat was WCW. WWF was the king of the castle, you know, and WCW at that point, I, personal opinion, could not compete from a... Some would say a talent point of view, some would say a production point of view, organizational point of view, because WWE, like I say, was, was the top dog. But when Eric comes in, and I, I didn't add this in the start, but Eric, I'm, I'm going to blow your horn here because you are one of only two men to literally revolutionize the wrestling industry. The other one is Vince. Um, and it's, it's amazing. Uh, and that was just in my head when, when I was um, pulling that out there. But, you know, you, you looked around at everything and you said, right, okay, what do we need to do to make this company profitable? It, it was well known and well documented. WCW was losing a lot of money, and we're talking millions. And I am from a business owner. I cannot even think of losing millions and millions and millions, and not being okay with it, but to allow it to happen. Um, and Eric comes in. He's, he's hired, and, and he gets the opportunity. And he's saying, I think pretty much everything, right down to the pens and pencils, anything that didn't need to be there. It was how can we cut costs? The big things that you did, obviously, was to cut the house shows because they weren't drawing um, and to, to look at really changing things up. What was it that you did, Eric, to really begin to turn? Because you were essentially brought in almost in hindsight to be the savior of WCW here. Um, what was it that you start to do and start to look around for, for the opportunities to, to really make this work? Well, it was, there were really two things. One was, as you, as you pointed out, to cut costs because yeah. WCW, at the time, when I was hired as executive producer, WCW the previous year had gross revenues, total revenues of about $25 million. Mm -hmm. Of that $25 million, they lost $10 million. Wow. Which is staggering. Yes. Um, you know, if a $25 million company loses a half a million a year or even a million yeah it's not good but it's not horrible yeah if there are other things because you know we were we were supplying content to turner broadcasting and that did have a value but um nonetheless you know when you're losing 10 million dollars a year on a company that's only generating 25 million dollars a yeah. year you've got problems bigger than revenue absolutely you've got you've got expense issues so the first thing that i could do it's not that the first thing i wanted to do because i'm not a finance guy you know okay. by nature going to that other side of my brain that i have to force myself to pay attention to um but the only thing i could attack was the wasteful spending yeah and and the lack of discipline over expenditures and expenses and that's when you know famously i called in all of my directors and all my vps into a meeting and i said okay I want, you know, brought him in. There was probably 15 or 18 of them at the time. Sat down at the table and I said, okay, I want, I looked at my watch. I said, I want each of you to go to your offices. I want you to count the number of pens in your desk. I want you to count the number of pencils in your desk. And I want to know how many paper clips that you have in wow. your drawer. And they thought I was joking. They thought I was a, they thought I was a gag. Mm -hmm. I said, I'm serious. And you wasted one minute. You've got 19 minutes left. I'll see you in 19 minutes. And they all got up and it was like, they, they, they looked at me like I was some kind of an alien, but they came back mm -hmm. and I went around the table and they all reported how many pens and pencils and paper clips they had. I said, great. Now we're beginning to understand what our resources are. And we need to focus on those resources. So if you have 20 pens in your desk, guess what? You don't need 20. You only need two. Yeah. In case one, one works and one in case it quits working. Same thing with the pencils. Any more than 50 paper clips is a waste. So disperse them accordingly. And, and all that was, was my way. And I didn't read that. I, I think, I, I think it came to me in the spur of the moment, uh -huh. actually, because that's how most of my stuff happens. The good stuff anyway. And I, I said, this is, this is my point. We have to manage our resources. If yeah. we can't manage our re resources, there's no way we can move forward. And then I kind of went from pens and, and pencils and paper clips to travel. Mm -hmm. 
I knew firsthand because I saw how horribly abused the travel system was that there were probably no less than 150 to $200,000 a year in fraudulent and wasteful or bogus travel expenses. Wow. Guy, wrestlers used to brag about it. Yeah. They, used to, they used to brag about it. So I immediately cut all that. And then one of the most unpopular decisions I made, This and I understand why it was unpopular. I wanted to take, I, 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 I determined since WCW was paying for the airline tickets that the talent was using, uh-huh. that WCW should get the benefit of the miles, the frequent flyer miles, and not the talent. That way we could further offset our travel expenses yes. by you like just like you would in your personal life. Yeah, yeah. That didn't go over too well, <laughs> not only in WCW. But when other executives in Turner Broadcasting found out about it, they was like, whoa, because if you start doing it, they're going to make us do that. So I got a lot of pushback on that. But that started the mindset of let's conserve our resources. Once we've conserved them, now let's start thinking about where we want to deploy them. And that's why I cut out the house shows. My, My big decision at that point was to shut down all the house shows, shut down any kind of promotion or activity, the WCW magazine, all of the ancillary things that were going on that were not making any money, that were costing money. I got rid of all of that and I put whatever resources were left into television because my philosophy was, my belief was that if you create demand in the television property and increase the production values, increase the talent, bring it up to the, at that point, into the mid nineties, instead of the 1980s, um, that eventually you'll create demand for the product and then you can return to to live events and increase your pay-per-view buy rates and things like that. So that was the big transition for me, like in 93 and 94, and it proved to be correct. In part two of the Mind, Body and Soul podcast with John Morris with special guest Eric Bischoff, we'll be discussing Eric's thoughts on the fall of WCW, what it meant to him, the British Bulldog accident, the battles that many substance-dependent wrestlers face, and so much more. All that on the next episode of the Mind, Body and Soul podcast with John Morris. As always, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Tell a friend because it could be the very thing that helps them in their journey to find balance in day-to-day life. Until next time, I have been your host, John Morris. This has been the Mind, Body, and Soul podcast. Take care, and God bless.